Hello, brothers and sisters in Christ. Can the Christian be carnally minded? Romans chapter 8. The last study we did in this series, uh, Romans chapter 7, Paul's talking about his conversion, how his mind changed, how he saw the law, you know, how he saw sin, and he went, as we're going to find out in here, in this chapter, he went from being carnally minded, walking after the flesh, to being spiritually minded and walking after the spirit. But what I like about this chapter we're going to go through is Paul could have just left it at, you know, uh, that was my experience. Everybody has their own religious experience and it can be different and everything. And this was just my religious experience. No, as we're going to find in this passage, Paul says, what I went through, you should be going through. Every Christian should be going through. This is true conversion. You go from being carnally minded to spiritually minded. That's true conversion. Okay. So let's start in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, and we're going to be jumping around the Bible. I love going around the Bible. I am a King James Bible believer. If you missed the intro to this series and you missed the first uh, Romans chapter 7, make sure to stop this and go back and watch those and then come back to this one. Okay. So, verse chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And I had a brother correct me, so I'm going to try to go through this and focus to make sure that if it's a capital S Spirit, sometimes the lower S Spirit, when it's talking about being spiritually minded, it's saying that you're, you're open to being able to uh, follow the capital S Spirit. But I need to make sure that I say capital S Spirit when it actually says capital S Spirit. So right there we see a capital S Spirit, and it says there's no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh. Now is that saying you have to be sinlessly perfect after salvation? No. What's that saying there? You're not to walk after the flesh. You struggle with the flesh, you're going to sin, but you're not going to walk after the flesh. And people, the whole point of this study is about people who try to justify being a carnal Christian, being a carnal Christian. What are they doing? They're walking after the flesh. So according to this passage, if you walk after the flesh, you're not in Christ Jesus, and condemnation is still on you. Okay? Uh, Romans 5, 17. Turn back a couple pages. Romans 5. Actually, one page. 5, 17. So we're going to look at this, okay? When, when did sin enter the world and condemnation start? Now if you read, you can read a lot of this, it's talking about, uh, we're going to learn it's about Adam. Verse 17, For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which received abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to, con to condemnation, there's our word, even so by the righteousness of one the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, it's talking about Adam, many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the the offense might abound, but when sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Okay. It's saying there no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. When did condemnation come into the world? When sin entered the world. Okay. Adam ate the apple. He disobeyed God. Sin entered the world. Okay. Now, that's an important part here. Remember, we're always going to be focusing on in Christ Jesus. I got another study I'm going to do. Um, it's going to be a great study. It's just going to be a quick one, hopefully, but it's going to be very visual. But it's about what does it mean to be in Christ Jesus. All right? In Christ Jesus. Condemnation, if you are in Christ Jesus, condemnation's not on you. And what's the evidence that condemnation's not on you and that you're in Christ Jesus? You don't walk after the flesh. Okay? All right? You, you walk after the Spirit. You have the Holy Spirit in you. And walking is an action. The life you live, the changed life, is evidence that you're in Christ Jesus. 
Now, I want to throw this out there again. We talked about it the last study, Romans 7, uh, chapter 7, 7 through 9. We'll read it real quick. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taken occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. I had to throw a sin there real quick. Condemnation is not on a child that doesn't know they haven't sinned. Okay, when a child is born to the age of accountability, people always like to argue over the age of accountability. I honestly believe that there was times where you could go back in the past and a kid at 12 years old who, when the father was sick, he could take care of the farm. He knew responsibility. He could take responsibility. He was very mature at 12 years old. Uh, could a kid be at the age of accountability at 10 or 12 years old back then? Absolutely, I believe that. But today, do our 12 year olds, are they like that? If mom and dad get very sick, can a 12 year old just step up and go, okay, I'm gonna start cleaning the house and I'm gonna start cooking and I'm gonna start doing this. I can take care of it, mom and dad. No. So I just wanna throw that in there. That's why people get on to me and say, I got saved when I was five. I got saved when I was 10. And I'm like, my generation, there's no way, okay? I was so immature, and people say that's you. I was so worldly, so it just we're not we're not teaching our kids today to grow up at the speed they're supposed to. So I mean, maybe some of you guys can. I don't want to go off on a tangent, but understand what I'm saying. Hopefully, uh, back in the past, they didn't have all the things they have today to distract you: video games, movies, TV shows, entertainment, flesh-driven, like everything's flesh-driven around us. Okay. Um, back in the past, it was about, hey, we have work to do. The sons hung out with their fathers. They learned trade skills. They learned how to do things. They had to mature. They had to grow up. Like I said, you had like some, a kid that was 12 years old could take over the responsibility of the farm if the dad felt got sick or the dad had to go somewhere. He'd take over the farm for the day. This is a 12-year-old. Today, you can't even imagine a 12-year-old doing that. Okay? But I just want to get back to the subject. The condemnation is not on a child that doesn't know that they've sinned against God and can truly understand what that means to sin against God, the consequences. Nowadays you have a lot of people telling the kids, uh, you need to believe in Jesus. So say yes, you believe in Jesus. I believe in Jesus. Do you believe in your sinner? Just say you're a believer. you believe in the sinner. I believe I'm a... They're just repeating what they've been told by their parents or these Bible buildings. It's not heartfelt. And it's evident because all these people that got saved as a child You'll see them turn their back on absolute truth, or they'll turn back their back on Jesus completely and say, I was once a Christian, but now. Why? Because it's not a conversion it has to happen in the heart. It's a heart thing. But condemnation is not on a child. Condemnation is on someone who knows they've sinned against God, and they walk after the flesh. Okay, when you get saved, condemnation's not on you anymore. So Romans 8, chapter 2, verse 3. Or chapter 8, verse 2 through 3, if I can say it right. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus, there's the in Christ Jesus, hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. The weak through the flesh, what, the law, what it means by that, as we learned last, last study, that the law is a good thing. But the law proves that you can't be saved by it. Your flesh, your sinful, wicked flesh is too weak. You're going to fall into sin and temptation, and you're going to sin, and the moment you sin, you failed. Okay? The law can't save you. What is the law? It's a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. So, the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus versus the law of sin and death. We see the controversy then. Saved versus lost, okay? Uh, John 6, 63. Turn to John 6, 63. I always look and go, is that right? 63 verses? <laughs> and it is. John 6, 63. Okay. 
It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. Remember what we read about there. With, with The flesh was weak over here. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh. Okay? It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, and they are life. Okay? The spirit, right there, for the law of the spirit of life, you can see spirit there in life, and what's it in? Christ Jesus. Okay? And it's made me free from the law of sin and death. So, as we see there, that the spirit is what quickeneth, and the flesh profit nothing, and that's what it's talking about here. Let's turn to 2 Corinthians 3.6 real quick. Second Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. Mm -hmm. Now, I just lost my place. I've got to go back and try to get my place again. Thank you, Lord. Verse 3. Where it says that God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, in Romans 8, verse uh, 3, uh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemning sin in the flesh. And what we're going to read here, 2 Corinthians 5, 8, uh, 21. 521. For He hath made Him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Okay? God sending His own Son in the likeness of sin, full flesh, and for sin, condemning sin in the flesh. And that's when we move on to verse 4, where it says that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. But I don't want to jump ahead a little bit, but I wanted to throw that in there. Okay? Now you read John 3, 16 through 21. Everybody loves John 3, 16 through 21. And it talks about the condemnation again. But what's the condemnation is when you read that? I just go there anyway. Uh... John 3.16. We've said it a lot. I've said it in a lot of my studies. People like John 3.16, but they don't like to keep reading. Okay. 16 through 21, if you want to get the full context. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world. There's the condemnation but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. Spiritually minded. Okay, but he that doeth truth cometh to the light. They walk after the Spirit. But the condemnation here, what is that condemnation it's talking about there? That light has come into the world, into the world and men love darkness rather than light. Sin. The condemnation of sin. People choose sin over God. They love being carnally minded, walking after the flesh, and they choose the world because that's the world's way. The world's way is being carnally minded and walking after the flesh. The world's way is sin. That's the condemnation. Okay? And we're seeing this here. The law, for verse 3, go back to Romans 8, verse 3. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. Jesus took on the punishment of sin and was condemned in the flesh. Okay? He became sin who knew no sin. I said this in the last study. Okay, Jesus, we all owe a debt. Jesus took that debt upon himself. Now you owe Jesus the debt. Okay. Jesus can wipe the slate clean and he can forgive you of that debt, or you can wind up paying for it yourself. Okay. I'm kind of jumping the gun, but we'll get to some verses about that. So, bottom line, okay, condemnation here. 
is sin. Sin is what condemns you to hell. So why are these people, I guess they're trying to push the fact that you can be a sinner and be saved. And we're not against that. I'm not against that. You can be a sinner and still be saved. You're going to be a sinner. That's why we call you a saved sinner. But what they're doing is they're trying to say that you can be carnal. You can just live in sin and sin and sin and sin and wicked sin. And it's like we look at them and go, but why did Jesus die on the cross? Well, he died for my sins. So why would you want to continue in your sins? If Jesus died for your sins, why would you want to continue in your sins? That's the condemnation. Sin was sending you to hell. Jesus paid for that sin. He saved, supposedly saved you. Why would you continue living like you did before? If there was nothing wrong with the way you were living before, then why get saved? Why did Jesus die on the cross? We were learning right here, big time, why Jesus died on the cross. Okay, there's condemnation. You sin so much as one sin, you're worthy of hell. And we go into verse 4, 8, 4, where it talks about that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. Okay, who's in you? Jesus Christ. Who's also in you? The Holy Spirit. Okay, the righteousness of the law. Who walk not after the flesh, there it is again, the evidence that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. What's the evidence of that? Who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Okay. Who fulfilled the righteousness of the law? Well, if you go back a verse, it says right there, His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemns sin in the flesh. But we can look at, if you want to, go to Romans 4.8 sometime. Uh, Romans 4.15 and Romans 4.21. I mean, you can read the whole chapter of Romans 4. It talks about Jesus' righteousness being imputed to us. Okay? Jesus fulfilled the law. Somebody had to die because of sin. Either you're going to die and go to hell, or Jesus died and paid the price for your sins so you can go to heaven. Okay? That's what's going on here. Okay? The righteousness of the law, Jesus Christ. And it's fulfilled in us because you have the Holy Spirit in you. It's evidence. And once again, what's the outward showing, the physical evidence that you have the Holy Spirit in you? Who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. There's a capital S Spirit there. In verse 2, there was a capital S Spirit. In verse 1, capital S Spirit. Okay? It's talking about the Holy Spirit. Uh, Matthew 5.17, this is Jesus speaking. Think not that I come to destroy the law or the prophets. I came not to destroy, but to fulfill. Was it saying verse 4? That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us? Jesus is saying he fulfilled the law, and he did. And if you're saved, Jesus is in you, and he, and he fulfilled the law for you. The righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. You have Jesus' righteousness imputed to you. Now, this is all things we can say, we can say it, we can say it. But it's supposed to re reflect, it's supposed to re reflect in the life that you live. Walking after the Spirit. Spiritually minded. Romans 8, 5. Go into next Romans 8, 5. Okay. For they that are after the flesh. Key word here is, for these, this verse is who, finding out who the they are. Okay. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the Spirit, the things that are of the Spirit. Once again, we got capital S Spirit. Who are the they for they that mind the things of the flesh? Lost. But they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit? Saved. We're seeing a contrast here. Paul, through all this, is saying, okay, this is what I went through, verse uh, chapter 7, and then he's going through here saying it has to be this way. Okay, there is no other way. Your mind is going to change when you get saved. The way you thought it's all things in the past is not the way you're going to see things today as a saved sinner. Okay. Also, this is also, when you look at this, it's also evidence of Jesus' righteousness being imputed to us. Because what does it say in verse 4? The righteousness of the law may be filled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. In other words, you don't have Jesus' righteousness in you. But they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Okay, when you start 
being spiritually minded, the Holy Spirit comes in, starts changing your life. It's evidence that God's righteousness is in you, that Jesus is in you. So we got the they and they. Uh, John 16. Uh, turn to John 16, 13, verse 13 and 14. When it's talking about here, for they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. What we're going to see here is what you guys, brothers and sisters of Christ, have read before, hopefully, but if you're new, 13, Howbeit when He, the Spirit of truth, is come, He will guide you into all truth. For He shall not speak of Himself, but whatsoever He shall hear, that shall He speak, and He will show you things to come. So you mean to tell me right here, verse 5, but they that are after the Spirit, the Holy Spirit comes in, the things of the Spirit, they mind the things of the Spirit. God's going to open this book to you. You're going to have a physical change in, his, in your life. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word. Sanctify it through thy truth. Thy word is truth. God's going to start saying, hey, abstain from all appearance of evil. Hey, you're not supposed to be doing that. Hey, you're supposed to be doing this. Study to show thyself approved. The Holy Spirit opens this book to you. That's how you become spiritually minded. That's how you're able to walk after the Spirit. Mm -hmm. Also in verse 14 of John, I found that very interesting. Uh, chapter uh, John 16, verse 14, where it says, I, I didn't go that far. I forgot to. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. Talking about how the Holy Spirit brings you all into all truth. It also says, He shall glorify me. You mean the Holy Spirit shows us how to glorify God? So bottom line, you're able to walk after the Spirit, because you have the Holy Spirit in you, and He teaches you how to glorify God, give God thanks and everything, how to live your life. And He does it through His Word. How to please God. Okay? As we're going to find out, carnally minded, you can't please God being carnally minded. Uh, Romans 6, 1 and 2. Going back to Romans 6, 1 and 2. Okay. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live there any longer? Or live, sorry, live any longer therein? For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. We're supposed to be dead to, dead to sin, as it says right here. How shall we that are dead to sin live any... It's hard sometimes. Live any longer therein. Okay? There's a change. We live after the Spirit now. It basically, the way I've always explained it, is when you truly get saved, and this kind of opening my eyes more to it, for you, brothers and sisters in Christ, and for me, God's showing me there's more in depth of what it means. But if you want to sum it up, you go from 100%, it's about God. You, you start out with you. I'm doing it backwards. First, it starts out, It goes. you go from being 100% about yourself, your flesh. Your flesh is in charge, carnally minded, flesh driven. You're walking after the flesh. You're 100% about the flesh. Then you go from that to be in 100% about God. I mean, how many of you brothers and sisters of Christ can attest that in your life how everything's just become about God? Everything I do, I talk to God about. I pray about so much to God saying, hey, help me with this. Uh, Lord, thank you for this. Giving God glory in all things. Giving Him thanks in all things. It could be something as mediocre as me going down the hillside, cutting down a tree, cutting some limbs. I'm talking with the Lord. My whole life has become about Jesus Christ, pleasing God. Why were we created? For thy pleasure we are and were created. You go from being 100% about the flesh, about the world, to being 100% about God. Okay. That's the transition Paul's talking about here. Okay. He goes from being, oh, I'm doing things for the world, and he thinks he's a religious man, and he's doing things the world's way, and all this stuff, and he's saying there was a change. 
God came into my life, opened my eyes, and now it's 100% about God. Don't do this. Do that. Why would anybody sit there and defend being carnally minded and walking after the flesh and say you can still be saved? Well, as we read in uh, John 3, 16 through, this is the condemnation that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light. That's why they're pushing this. That's why they're fighting this. They love their sin. They want to keep their sin and be a Christian. And you can't do that. You can struggle with sin, but you can't walk after the flesh and keep your sin. So Romans 8, 6. Here's the big verse that started this whole study that I started looking into. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. To be carnally minded is death? Can you be a carnally minded and be a Christian? No, you can't. Okay? We showed the definitions in the uh, previous study of what carnally minded is. Okay, what carnally is. Uh, one of them is talking about lost state, unregenerated. Okay, to be carnally minded is death. Okay. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Carly minded is death, Romans 6, 16, and 17. We went through, th through this real quick. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey? Whether of sin unto death, or obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked, see, but God be thanked, that ye were the servants of sin, were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you, being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. But the part we're talking about in there, this is all great, whether of sin unto death, what does it say here? To be carnally minded is death. The carnal mind says, I have no problem with sin. I love sin. Sin is great. The flesh goes, oh yeah, I love it too. I mean, we're in sync. We're a team. And you start walking after the flesh. Carnal, I mean, you were walking after the flesh. You know what I'm saying? That's how it works. So if you're carnally minded, to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded, there's a lowercase s spirit there. To be spiritually minded is life and peace. To let the spirit... The Holy Spirit, I know it's capital S, but to let the Holy Spirit takes over your life and your spirit, and I say your uh, conscience can bear witness with the Holy Spirit, your spirit bears witness with the Holy Spirit and you listen to Him, you're in sync. Okay? You can hear the Holy Spirit, He can open this book to you, He cleans up your life. Okay, But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. What is this life and what is this peace? Just touch on it just a little bit. Galatians 2.20. I'm going to stay, keep your hand there. Always try my best to keep my hand in 8, Romans 8. But Galatians, Galatians 2.20. What's this thing about life? Okay. To be spiritually minded is life and peace. Verse 20, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless, lest I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. But notice there it says, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. You go back over here. We read about spiritually minded. It's a lowercase s spirit, but spiritually minded is life. What does it mean? The Holy Spirit comes in. Jesus Christ is in you, and you have life. Remember we talked about the Spirit quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. Okay? The Holy Spirit comes in. Now, what about, how about peace? John 14, 27. John 14, 27. 
Somebody gives us peace. Who gives us peace? John 14, 27. I just lost it. <laughs> John 14, 27. This is also talking about when the Holy Spirit comes in. Okay? He shall, if you go back to 16, He shall give you a comf another comforter. I'm not the Holy Spirit coming, but verse 27. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, I give, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither be it, neither let it be afraid. So when we're looking here, as usual, I lost my spot. But when you're looking in Romans 8, where it's talking about life and peace, Once again, even though it says a lowercase s spirit, I believe it's talking about the Holy Spirit. Your spirit bears witness with the Holy Spirit, and you see that, yes. I'm going the wrong direction, which is why it's taking forever. Okay. Sorry about this, brothers and sisters in Christ. Verse 6, I see, but to be spiritual mind is life and peace. As we see there, it's talking about the Holy Spirit coming in. And it says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. But then he talks, he's talking about he's sending the Holy Spirit with you. I'm not going to turn here, but 2 uh, Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Okay, what's the opposite of fear? Peace. Okay. God has given you a spirit of peace. Right? Being spiritually minded will bring you peace because, as we read here, God gives you the Holy Spirit. And what's the Holy Spirit able to do? Teach, tell you about power of love and a sound mind. The Holy Spirit gives you power to overcome sin in your life. That's why I say you can do, the Bible says you can do all things through Christ with strength in me. That's why I say it's God that got it out of my life through the Holy Spirit and His perfect written word. I can say this as many times as I can. Sanctify him through thy truth, thy word is truth. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. We're told that all scriptures given by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. You can have a perfect heart with the Lord, because the Holy Spirit is going to open this book to you. And you're going to have a desire to live for Jesus Christ. That's what it means to live for Jesus Christ. Oh, I just, it's with words. It's just with words. It's with your actions, too. Uh, the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Your life, how you live, is going to speak louder than your words. Okay. But let's look at there. It says, holy, when I read uh, 2 Timothy 1, 7, how it says that, but of, not a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and a sound mind. Okay. Holy Spirit gives you power through His Word. Okay? Uh, Ecclesiastes 8.4, if you want to turn there, you can. talks about where the Word of the King is, there is power. Who opens this book to us? The Holy Spirit. Okay? Love, John 14.23, If a man love me, he will keep my words. Okay? This book will give you power to overcome sin. This book will teach you how you can love the Lord, Jesus Christ. You know, if a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and will come unto him, and make our abode with him. And of a sound mind, 2 Timothy 2.15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. How do you have a sound mind? By studying this book. Who opens this book to you? The Holy Spirit. How many times, brothers and sisters in Christ, and I've done it myself, how many times have we have come to this book frustrated and we can't really figure it out because we're frustrated? We're not calm. There's times where I was reading something and I kept screwing up and I kept screwing this up and I'm like, I'd take a break and I went for a walk and I talked with the Lord and I prayed and sang some hymns, did some physical work, and when I came back and God calmed me down, Spirit of Peace, I was like, 
Why didn't I see that before? Okay, thank you, Lord. And now I know why. You can't come to this book agitated, angry, frustrated. God will give you peace. But when you come to this book with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit gives you peace, you'll see things. There's times I came to this book with the attitude, I want to see what I want to see. How many people said have started a study, I have done it, started a study going into the study saying this has got to be absolute truth. And as you do the study, you realize, okay, that's not quite right. What I thought wasn't right. Good example is when I did the rock study. I was going to, I try not to do this, and brother and sister Christ, don't do this. Don't stand up and say, this is absolute truth. No man, I never did this though, but no man has ever been called rock as a title except for Jesus Christ. So why could that rock be referring to Peter? And that verse that says, upon this rock, I shall build my church. The rock's talking about Jesus Christ. Yes, it's evidence, but I want to do a word study in the word rock and say, hey, it's never been used for any man except Jesus Christ. So you go into that study, it's absolute truth. I went through that whole study, and guess what? I got proven wrong by doing that study. Abraham was called the rock of Israel because he was the foundation. He was the one, as far as physical seed foundation, God started with Abraham. I will make you a great nation. My people are going to be through you. The, star, the number of the stars of the heaven, all the promises and covenants that were made with Abraham. I was proven wrong. Okay? There's times where the Holy Spirit's going to open your eyes because when I started that study, praise the Lord, it was a long study because the word rock is mentioned a lot. That was my first study video I think I did. And it, you got calmed down over a while and I started seeing things. God showed me new things. It's peace. God, when you have a spirit of life and peace, it's having the Holy Spirit in you that gives you life and He gives you peace. And when you have that peace, you don't have a spirit of fear. You get the you have a spirit of power. Give, overcome sin in your life, okay? Through His Word. Uh, we talked about if a man loved me, and then having a sound mind, okay? And the big thing here is, is are you in Christ Jesus? Do you have the Holy Spirit in you? That's what it means to be in Christ Jesus. Do you have the Holy Spirit in you? That's what Paul is saying here. When you get the Holy Spirit and God saves you, your mind's going to change. You cannot stay in the old man, the old mindset that, hey, I can live however I want and just say, I, I put it put it on, on Jesus' tab. I'm good to go. I can sin all I want. Just put it on His tab. Okay? Are you in Christ Jesus? Spiritually minded, walking after the Spirit. Do you have the Spirit of life and peace in you? Verse 7, how we know that carnally minded, there, that when it says in verse 6, that carnally minded is death, oh, how do we know that it has to do with being lost? Verse 7, because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither, neither indeed can be. What's the law of God? Sin, the wages of sin is death, the law of sin and death is, you've sinned against God, one sin, you're going to go to hell to burn for all eternity, and toss in the lake of fire to be burned for all eternity, because you've sinned against God, that's the punishment, the law of sin and death. But what's the law of God? Jesus came down, he became sin who knew no sin, was content, condemned sin in the flesh, right? He took that debt. Now, you want that debt paid for, you want that forgiveness, you want your sins washed away, you go through Jesus Christ. That's the law. And it's saying here that if you're carnally minded, you're an enmity against God, and you're not saved. You're not going through Jesus Christ. If you went through Jesus Christ, you would be spiritually minded, not carnally minded. That's why it says neither indeed can be. Okay? You cannot be carnally minded and be the friend of God. Why is that? I wonder if I'm going to jump ahead. So let's, let's go with the word enmity. Okay? Because there's one that talks about if, uh, you and my friends, if you do whatsoever I command you. I think I have a verse over here where we're going to go to that. Um, but I'll do it ahead of time. Okay? You cannot be a friend of God and an enemy of God. An enemy of God doesn't want to do anything that God says. Carnally minded means I love the flesh, 
not Jesus Christ. I love sin, not Jesus Christ. You cannot be carnally minded and be saved. You can't be an enemy of God and be the friend of God. They're opposites. A friend, you my friends, if you do whatsoever I command you, is Jesus speaking. Okay? Well, I ain't going to do what God commands me. Well, then if you're not Jesus' friend, what, that, what does that make you? An enemy. Okay? Lost people will do that. when you False converts, when you sit them down and say, God's command is this, God's command is that, what's their attitude towards it? Oh, that's just your interpretation. Or, well, that's just the King James Bible, but God's Word isn't perfect. Oh, God's Word's just a guideline. Oh, what is that? They're an enemy of God. Because a friend of Jesus would take his command seriously. Staying from all appearance of evil. And I hit up people this all the time because the reason I hit this up is that what I went through, and I have used it to testify against brothers and sisters in Christ and false converts, you can't sit there and justify wicked video games, movies, and TV shows and say, I'm a friend of Jesus. And I'm not saying that necessarily you're lost if you're newly saved, which is, we're going to get into the studies a little bit further. You're newly saved. Uh, you're going to have, uh, what is it, carnal things in your life, wicked things in your life, and God's going to start working on you. But you can't think about this. You can't sit there and say, there's nothing wrong with video games. And you can even sprout, because I've had people say, well, I play this one, it's not bad. I play that one, it's not bad. And then I tell them, but what about these other games you play that are bad? Oh, you know about those? Uh, yeah. Okay, they slip up. Out of the mouth of the heart, the mouth speaks. Okay? And, I, and you go, abstain from all appearance of evil. Why are you playing that wicked game? The games you think are innocent. If I show you something wrong in them, are you going to quit them? No, they're not. They're just going to keep saying they're innocent. They're innocent. Why? Why are people attacking this book when it comes to obeying God's commands. Do whatsoever I command you. Goes back to John 3.16. This is a condemnation that came into the world that men love darkness rather than light. They love their sin. You can't be the enemy of God and be the friend of God. Okay, enemy, the quality of being an enemy, the opposite of friendship, as we just said, a state of opposition. So James 4.4, 4, if you want to keep your place in Romans 8, and go to James 4.4. 4. I have this memorized, but some of these, I have a hard time with the addresses sometimes. So I'll start getting excited. And excited. I got this one memorized, and I quote it and realize it's not that verse, it's another verse. But James 4.4 4 should be the ye adulterers. Okay, James 4.4, 4, ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Listen to what we just said there, okay? Adulterers and adulteresses. We talked about this in the last study on chapter 7, Romans chapter 7, where it talks about the you're married to the world, the old man, and that has to die, so then you are free to be married to the new husband, which is Jesus Christ. So why are they using the word adulteress? God chose adulterers and adulteresses. Okay? Because there's people that think they can be a friend of the world. What's friend of the world? You are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. That's Jesus. So what's the opposite of that? Well, then you do whatever the world commands you. Carnally minded, flesh driven, you walk after the flesh, you do what they command you. You're a friend of the world. Okay? That's the enemy of God. Okay? So what they're doing is they're trying to say, I want to stay married to the old man and be married to Jesus Christ. You're an adulterer if you try to do that. You're false. You're a fake. You're a fraud. I could keep going. False convert. Okay? Servant of Satan. You love the world. You cannot be a friend of the world, obeying the commands of the world. The world's way is sin. Who's the lowercase g god of this world? Satan. So you can't be Satan's friend. You can't be the world's friend and be a Christian. But as we see there, it's still that whole mindset going from being carnally minded to spiritually minded. God saves you, comes in, everything changes. 100% about the flesh, 100% about Jesus Christ. Okay? And me against God. I believe that's exactly what this is talking about. A, you can't be married to the old man and the new man. That's called adultery. You can't be a friend of the world, obey the world's commands, and obey God's commands at the same time. You can't. 
So, John 15, turn to John 15, uh, 13, 14. John 15, verses 13 and 14. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friend. Ye are my friends, if you do whatsoever I command you. Okay, that was the verse that I put in there. Okay, When you're loving the world, okay, uh, being a friend of the world, we just said that. That means you're obeying its commands. But if you love Jesus Christ, you're going to obey his commands. If you, want him to, if you want Jesus to be your friend, and you're the friend of Jesus, you're going to obey his commands. What's evidence that you're not a Christian or a false convert? You're obeying Satan's commands, the ways of the world. That's, that's who your friend really is. Okay. So bottom line, it comes down to, in that sense, when we talk about James 4.4, 4, I kind of should have done it backwards. I should have done this verse first. But basically it comes down to this. You're going to choose God's way, over the world's way when you get saved. And you've got people who want the world's way and claim they're doing God's way. They're choosing the world over God and claiming to be a Christian. That's what this whole movement about is saying, hey, you can just live however you want and be saved. Oh, you can be a carnal Christian. You can be a... What it is is they want to do things the world's way and claim to be a Christian. They don't want to do it God's way. And I'm telling you, brother, sister Christ, you set them down and you talk to them about sin, you talk to them about obedience to God and His Word, and it doesn't work out. Why? Because they don't want to do it God's way. They want to do it their way. And their way is carnally minded, walking after the flesh, and no shock here, their way, that lines up with the world's way. Big shock there. 1 John 2.15 1 John 2.15 Okay. Here it is again, 15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. What is the world's way? Carnally minded, walking after the flesh. The flesh being in charge. Satan being your master. Okay. Love not the world. You cannot, for carnally minded is death, but spiritual mind is life and peace because the carnal mind is enemy against God. You cannot love the world and be a Christian. And I've said this before. People say, well, it's more of instruction and righteousness. It says that the love of the Father is not in you. How can you be a Christian and not have the love of the Father in you? The Holy Spirit in you. Jesus Christ in you. Okay. It's that simple. If you don't have the love of God in you, you don't have the Holy Spirit in you, He's not in you, and you aren't in Him. You are not in Christ Jesus. Uh, Romans 5.10. Another passage. Let's go to verse 6. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good, for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love towards us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Verse 10. For if, Bible if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. When we were enemies, past tense, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son. You know, enmity against God, to be carnally minded, is enmity against God. Note the if there. When you look at someone who professes to be saved, everything we've been talking about, carnally minded versus spiritually minded, okay, if when we were the enemies of when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Wait a minute. If you're still an enemy, the if doesn't apply. You're not reconciled to God. You're still an enemy of God. 
I want to keep the world, I want to keep my flesh, I want to keep doing things that I, the Bible says you're not supposed to, I don't have to keep God's commands and be a Christian. Oh no, I can just live however I want to live. And that's the foundation of the brunt. I remember we talked about this, over 50% of the world claims to believe in a Jesus. And that's the foundation of it. You can have the world and claim to be saved and go into wherever paradise that you claim you're going to be going to. Whether it be heaven or some other paradise that believe in a Jesus. That's what this is all about. You're supposed to be reconciled to God. You're not supposed to be an enemy. So we see here that when it says, uh, because the carnal mind is enemy against God, we know that in verse 6, for to be carnal minded is death. It's talking about going to hell. You can't be an enemy of God and be a Christian. Okay? You can't be going to hell and be saved. It just doesn't work that way. Okay? Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 18 and 19. Real quick, 2 Corinthians 5, 18 and 19. I made the mistake again. I'm in first. 2 Corinthians 5, 18 and 19. And all things are of God who have reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself not imputing their trespasses unto them and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation now then we are ambassadors for Christ I want to throw that part in there the ministry of reconciliation you're the enemy of God we're here to help you reconcile so you can be a friend of God, you're not the enemy anymore. We're here to reconcile you to God. We teach repentance towards God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. Call upon the name of the Lord to save you. That's what we preach. That's the reconciliation that leads someone from being an enemy of God to being a friend of God. And what did Jesus say? You're my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. When you get saved, you're going to want to do what God commands you. Once again, reconciling. Going from being an enemy to being a friend. You cannot be the enemy of God, or in this case, be carrying the mind at a certain state that makes you the enemy of God, and be saved. You can't be a friend and an enemy at the same time. Uh, Romans 8.8. 8. And this is also key. What is another evidence of somebody who's a false convert that's carnally minded and walks after the flesh? Verse 8. Uh, go back into Romans chapter 8, verse 8. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Okay? You cannot please God. Ro Revelation 4.11. Uh, I thought I was going to write it down, but I guess I'm going to turn to it. Romans 4.11. I've said this before, brothers and sisters in Christ have said this, I've seen them put it out before. What's the purpose of life? Why were you created? Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Okay. That's why you were created, and it shows here that if you're currently minded, so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. And I've said this in the other studies, so I'll say it again here. There's two, I believe there's two foundations for what it means to be when it says in the flesh. Two definitions, if you want to say. There's in the flesh, as we're reading here. Carnally minded, walking after the flesh. The in the flesh is contrary to being in Christ Jesus. They're opposites. Then there's the definition of in the flesh that I'm in this body of flesh. Uh, we'll get to a verse that says, I'm in this flesh serving the Lord. We're two-thirds redeemed. We still have this body of flesh that gets tired, that gets sick, that tries to get you to fall into sin temptation. Understandable. But there's two contrasts. There's I'm in this body, this actual physical body, and then there's in the flesh, like your flesh is in charge. The opposite of being in Christ Jesus. There's two of them. So some people read this saying, well, you know... 
in the flesh cannot please God. That just means, you know, in your walk with the Lord, your walk in life, you know, there's times you can fall into the flesh and you don't please God. This is not talking about that. This is contrasting being in Christ Jesus or in the flesh. You can't be both. Okay? This is talking about salvation when it comes to being in the flesh. You're either in Christ Jesus or your flesh is in charge. Carly minded, walking after the flesh, the world's way, your flesh is your master. Satan appeals to the flesh, you worship Satan, because then your flesh gets, gets pleased. Okay. So we'll get to that. Okay. And notice there it says, we read about, um, for thy pleasure they are work created. Uh, and those that stand for the flesh, because we read it here, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. And we read that other verse, because I already dropped it. And those that stand for the flesh cannot give Jesus glory in their life. They can't give God honor. They can't give honor to Jesus with their lives and how they're living. And they're not letting Him be the power in His life. Remember we read about the Holy Spirit giving you power. Okay? Peace. He comes in peace. He gives you power. They can't let the Holy Spirit be power in their lives if they're in the state. Why? Because they don't have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit won't come in if they say, I'm going to still be married to the old man and then claim to be married to the new man, Jesus Christ. Oh, I'm going to keep my old life and try to be saved. It doesn't work that way. It's not workspace to say, hey, Paul's saying there's a change that comes in. Your mind changes. You go from being carnally minded to being spiritually minded. And it shows with the life that you live. And I keep pleading with the brethren. I always bring up... Uh, Movies, TV shows, and video games, but there's people out there that struggle with alcohol, with cigarettes. Um, weed is a big thing around here, with drugs. I mean, whatever it is, fornication, all this stuff, you cannot please God in that stuff. You cannot give God glory in sin. You cannot give God honor when you're living in sin. Okay? And people who are lost cannot give God power in their life. Okay? Because Jesus, the Holy Spirit, isn't in them. Right here, understand what it says. Cannot please God, and in context, we're reading about lost versus saved. When I fall into sin, don't get me wrong, I'm not pleasing God. But someone who is lost, carnally minded, walking at the flesh, they cannot please God. I can. The Holy Spirit's come in, He's opened this book to me and said, This pleases God, do this. Don't do that or else you're not going to please God. I can still please God. I might fall into sin and that doesn't please God, but I am capable of pleasing God because I am saved. The lost world cannot please God. You can use this verse for instruction and righteousness for a walk as a Christian, but for what the context is here, it's talking about the lost world. They cannot please God. Why? Because they are in the flesh. They're not in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Verse 9. Back to Romans chapter 8, verse 9. But ye are not in the flesh. There's the contrast. That's what I mean by in Christ Jesus versus being in the flesh. Two types of definition for the flesh. We're in this body of flesh that I can pinch and hurt, touch, and then... When it comes to salvation, are you in the flesh or are you in Jesus Christ? But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, capital S there. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you, now there's an F. You're not in the flesh, the Spirit, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. In other words, it's going to be evident. Uh, you're not going to be in the flesh if you have the Holy Spirit in you. Okay. Now, if any man have not this Spirit of Christ, capital S, he is none of his. And people get on to us, brothers and sisters in Christ, when we look at this book and go, wait a minute, your life doesn't line up to this book. And we're to have grace. We're to have grace for someone who's newly saved. They're going to have so much carnal, carnal things in their life, their life is going to be so messed up, 
And that's when God comes in with his broom and his dustpan and he starts cleaning up that person's life by the Holy Spirit through his perfect written word. That person's going to have a desire to serve God and he's going to say, okay, we're going to put that in the dustbin. It's got to go. Okay, you're supposed to be doing this now. Let me give you the, the tools. Here's, he gives you his word. Okay, you're supposed to be doing this. Don't do that. Okay. But you look at a person's life. I'm a mature Christian. I've been saved for three, four years plus, And I'm just throwing it in there. Not that there's a specific time period, but there is no such thing as I've been saved for 20 years. And you look like the world, act like the world. You're just so carnally minded, walking after the flesh. You're lost and you're false. It's that simple. The Bible says so. Okay? You don't walk after the flesh, but in the Spirit. But if the Spirit of God dwell in you. But if, now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. The changed life is evidence that you have the Spirit of Jesus Christ. There's no changed life. You look like the world. You act like the world. You justify sin. You reject God's Word and claim to be a Bible believer. But anytime someone says, hey, what you're doing is wrong. It's sinful. It's wicked. The Bible says it's wrong. We do it out of grace and love. Oh, I don't want to hear it. There's nothing wrong with it. I, I, I know I'm carnal. Yes, I'm carnal. Yes, I, I fall, I'm falling into a lot of sin. But you know what? I'm still a Christian. Is that the, way, the attitude they should have? Should they be saying, I'm still a Christian, though? In other words, it's no big deal. I'm still a Christian. I didn't lose my salvation. I'm still a Christian. Is that the attitude that we're supposed to have, brothers and sisters of Christ? Or should our attitude be, you come to me and you catch me in sin, and I'm like, this is your attitude. You're right. You quote a scripture at me. I read the scriptures to verify it. Yes, you're right. I'm, I'm sorry. I was wrong, Lord. Please forgive me. Thank you, brother in Christ, sister in Christ, for showing me. Pray for me. I'm getting it out of my life. Pray to help me keep it out of my life. You know what I'm saying? That's the attitude of someone who's saved, not... Well, yeah, you know, I'm I, I kind of failing the Lord here. And I'm kind of failing the Lord there. But you know what? I'm still a Christian. I'm still saved. And I can continue in that. They're justifying it by saying, I'm still a Christian. I'm still saved. Is that the mindset of someone who's truly saved? Or is that the mindset of someone who's carnally minded? Right? Matthew 7. Uh, we're going to go back to Matthew 7. Keep your hands there. Matthew chapter 7. Verse 22 and 23. We need to start in 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. How can you do the will of God if you don't have the Holy Spirit and you're not spiritually minded? But he that doeth the will of my Father is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Well, I'm standing for this word. And in thy name have cast out devils. We see that along the charismatics. They're, not, they're imparting devils. They're not casting them out. And in thy name done many wonderful works. People at these Babel buildings. Oh yeah, I mow the lawn. I'm part of the worship team. And... And you know, I, I cleaned the sanctuary, and I helped rebuild this part and that part, and you know, I've done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. What's iniquity? Sin. Carly minded, walking after the flesh. They do all these so-called good things to justify the bad things. And they come out, and the, a lot of them just come out and say, it's, there's nothing wrong with this. This isn't sin. Uh, the Bible says it's sin. I don't care. That's not what the Bible says. That's just your interpretation. It all depends on how you look at it. And everybody else is doing it. I can go through a whole list of things that Peter Ruckman went through, a great list of things that people say to justify their sin. Okay? Right there, we see evidence of people claiming, I'm a Christian, but Jesus denies them. Right here, it says that if they don't have the Holy Spirit in them, the Spirit of Christ, He is none of His. God doesn't leave us hanging. People say, well, you can't judge, you can't judge. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God. Okay? Right here, God is telling us, right here, you can judge. If He doesn't have the Holy Spirit, He's none of mine. Oh, but you can't judge whether He has the Holy Spirit. 
then why warn us? Why warn us? Why would I, I, I can't, you can't judge, I could throw a lot of scenarios out there. Bottom line, you have someone heading for destruction, but I can't judge that destruction, so I can't warn them. It makes no sense, okay? God lets us know that there's going to be false converts, and we're really going to get into that in First and Second Corinthians. Paul is saying that a lot of things you didn't realize that God showed me. He's saying, if you might be, some of you, he's addressing all the people professing to be saved, but then he only says, some of you, or this. He's saying that not all of you are saved. He's judging salvation, and people say we're not allowed to judge salvation. Okay? So we see there, he's going to be denying people. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5. If you want to go to 2 Corinthians 5. Another situation. And this time I'm going to 2 Corinthians, not first. 2 Corinthians 5. 17 and 18. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself, to Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, which we talked about earlier. But you're a new creature in Christ Jesus. Okay? If you're not a new creature in Christ Jesus, you don't have the Holy Spirit in you. And if you don't have the Holy Spirit in you, you're none of his. Okay? Once again, everything goes from being 100% about the flesh to 100% about God. Okay? Remember we talked about eight, uh, Romans chapter 8 verse 1. Walking after the flesh versus walking after the spirit. Verse 2, the law of the spirit of life, which is in Christ Jesus, versus the law of sin and death. Verse 4 talks about God's righteousness being in us versus having uh, unrighteousness in you. Okay, you see the contrast? 100% about the world, about your flesh, and 100% about God. Right? And then we talked about 2 Corinthians 5.21, having the Holy Spirit in you, guiding you into all truth. Okay? A new creature in Christ Jesus. What does that mean? The Holy Spirit comes in, you go from being carnally minded to spiritually minded. That's what it means by all things have become new. Everything about my life is about Jesus Christ. It's about pleasing Jesus Christ, obeying Jesus Christ, serving Jesus Christ, loving Jesus Christ. If a man love me, he will keep my words. This is Jesus speaking. It's all about Jesus. And these people out there that are defending these carnal, being a carnal Christian, being a carnal Christian, it's all about themselves. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I hopefully this can, will encourage you to once again, I've done this myself, go through your life again. Walk through your home with your wife and talk with the Lord, talk with your wife, pray, and Walk to the home and say, Lord, is there anything evil in our home that we still need to give up? Talk, sit down with your wife. Talk with the Lord. with your, you know, Honey, is there things that we aren't doing we need to do more of? You can do it one-on-one -on -one with the Lord. You know, you know, the husband talking to the wife. Or if you're a single man or a single woman, hey, Lord, is there any evil things in my home? I talked to one brother in Christ that he, I told him that he needs to get a studio apartment if he has to. If you have to, worst case scenario, you get a studio apartment, you get a job, if it's a part-time job, you're living month to month, you're barely getting by, but that home is your home that God has given you, and you can make it a godly home. You're old, 18 or older, you're living with your parents, they're wicked, there's sin, there's temptation around you, get out and get that studio apartment. Oh, I got roommates and everything, and they're lost, I'm saved, and there's a lot of... Get out and get that studio apartment. Yeah, but it's just one little... I stayed in a studio apartment that was smaller than the room I'm living in now. And it just had a built-in bed, and it had a little bathroom, and it had a little counter over here where it had a sink, and I had a microwave. I know some people aren't for microwaves. But it had a sink, it had a microwave, and that's where I lived once. But you know what? It was cheap. I was working a part-time job. I wasn't grateful. I was lost back then about it. But if that's what it takes, you can have something like that and make it a godly home. Free, abstain from all appearance of evil. Right? You do what it takes, brothers and sisters in Christ. Go through your life. Say, Lord, am I doing, not doing something as much as I should be doing it? Okay? That's what I'm hoping this is encouraging. And those who are false, I'm hoping this is opening your eyes to the fact that 
you're carnally minded, you're walking after the flesh to say, you know what? I've been holding on to my sin. I'm not truly saved. I'm walking after the flesh. I'm carnally minded. I'm doing things the world's way. Wait a minute. My flesh is in charge. I need to get saved. I'm not really saved. That's what I'm hoping this gets through to people. True salvation, there's going to be a conversion. There's going to be a change. You're going to be a new creature in Christ Jesus. Back to Romans 8, 10. Remember verse 9 said, If any man have not the Spirit, he is none of his. So we're going to read 10 and 11. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. Okay, who's the righteousness that's in you? The law of righteousness is fulfilled in us, Jesus Christ. Who's inside you? The Holy Spirit. I always say that because people don't like the Godhead. They like their pagan trinity. Uh, they're one and the same. So you have Jesus in you and you have the Holy Spirit in you. So if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. We just read that. So you have righteous, God's righteousness in you. Verse 11. But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dwell, dead dwell in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by the Spirit that dwelleth in you. Okay. The body is dead because of sin. The wages of sin is death. Okay. Does that mean carly minded and walking after the flesh? Okay, body is dead because of sin. Right here, because it says that. The body is dead because of sin. The way just uh, to be carly minded is death. It's not the same thing. Okay, when it says here that um, He will quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. What this is talking about is, remember that change. You're in the flesh when you're lost. And you go from that to be in, in Christ Jesus. The old man is dead and buried. You get resurrected as a new man. Okay? This is not justification saying, hey, you can still be a carnal Christian, carnal Christian, you can just live wickedly everything. Because right here it says that we've been, the Holy Spirit has quickened your mortal bodies by, the, or that Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by the Spirit that dwelleth in you. See, we have the Holy Spirit in us, that, that's okay, we're justified, we can sin all we want. That's not what's going on here. Okay, As we're reading here, there's a change. There's a big change that's supposed to happen. I just, for the longest time, I didn't get it when I was newly saved. A lot of people were fighting truth. They're fighting the Bible. They're fighting the major doctrines. They're fighting instruction and righteousness. I was just a mess. I was a complete wreck when I first got saved, and you're supposed to be. But I had such a love and a desire for the Lord. The Holy Spirit came in. I'm like, what do I need to do? Or get that out? Okay, it's gone. This, like a zeal, the word by the word zeal for the Lord. Uh, I need to do this, I'm going to do this. I had a desire to do that. And then you come across these people that are like, mm, it's okay. I mean, if you want to do that, that's nice. That's, it's just not for me. And you're like, what's wrong with you? you should, how come you don't... Why is there a difference between how I acted and how I was and how they are? And you get so antsy. Because they're lost. They profess to be saved, but they're lost. Right? And it took a while, when you start maturing as a Christian, I started seeing that. Right? The Spirit of God dwell in you, you're made alive. Okay? The Spirit of life and peace. The Holy Spirit comes in and tells you how to live your life, and He gives you peace. You start having true joy in your life. You can go through the hardest times ever, and God will still give you peace through it. He'll give you some joy through it. That's what it means to be saved. You're no longer carnally minded, but spiritually minded. Now, there's three Bible ifs in 9, 10, and 11. Okay, that we just read there. Chapter 8, verse 9, 10, 11. There's a lot of, there's three ifs. Now, remember, going back to the story of the wine, Mark chapter 2, verse 22, where, it's, where Jesus is speaking, saying, you cannot put new wine in old bottles. Okay? If you don't have the new bottle, which is evidence that you have new wine, you cannot have the new wine. You can't have the new wine if you have the old bottle. You have to have a new bottle. That's what's going on here. If, if, if. There's a lot of people that have the old bottle and say, I have the new wine. 
Phil, I'm the old man still, but I'm a Christian. I have the Holy Spirit. No, you don't. Okay. And verse 11, the old bottle, it's supposed to be dead. Okay, the old man is supposed to be dead. The new bottle is supposed to be living. Okay. You're to live for Jesus Christ. So, go back to Romans 8, chapter 12, 13. All through this, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, Christ be in you, Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus. Um, you're not to walk after the flesh. Okay, your body's being quickened. Okay, I'm already alive and I got saved, I'm still alive. You're like, what's the change? I went from being in the flesh, the, the, the body, the mind, everything in charge. Uh, carly minded, walking after the flesh, being in the flesh, to being in Christ Jesus. I'm now spiritually minded, capital S Spirit. I walk after the Spirit, capital S Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Okay? I'm spiritually, even though it's lowercase s, spiritually minded is life and peace. Okay? That's the difference there. Romans 8, verse 12. We're going to read 12 through 13. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit, capital S Spirit, do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. i got to throw this out there real quick. It says that through the flesh, through the spirit, do mortify the deeds of the, of the body, ye shall live. You realize it's the Holy Spirit that comes in and says, hey, you know that stuff you're doing a lot in your life? Look how sinful and wicked it is. And then you look at it and go, that's horrible. Oh my, that's so horrible. Why didn't I see that before? Because you didn't have the Holy Spirit. And you're dealing with all these lost people that are professing to be saved. You'd let them know, hey, that wickedness is in your life. That's so wicked. That's so vile. And they're like, eh, it's no big deal. Eh, it's no big deal. Why? Because they don't have the Holy Spirit in them to show them something so they can be mortified by that sin in their life. Mm -hmm. Mortified by the deeds of the body, you shall live. Okay. People use that for instruction of righteousness. Physically, if you live by the flesh and do things that destroy the physical body, you're going to have to reap it. Reap what you sow. Okay. But if you live after the flesh, you shall die. It's talk, also, I believe in this context that we're reading, it's talking about walking after the flesh. If you're carnally minded and you walk after the flesh, you're going to die and go to hell. Okay? But if, these are Bible ifs, ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. Remember, you can be lost, totally destroy your body and how you live, and get saved. And... And God will keep you alive for a little bit. Or he might, you might just live until you're 80 or 90. But notice that says you shall live. Right? All that stuff in the past doesn't disappear like that. So in context, I believe this is talking about salvation. The change of mind. Therefore, brethren, we are not debtors. We, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. When you get saved, you don't walk after the flesh anymore. You don't have a carnal mind. That's what's, being, that's what's going on here. Alright, uh, Psalms 97, 10, you don't have to turn there. Ye that love the Lord hate evil. He preserveth the soul of his saints, he delivereth them out of the hand of the wicked. Ye that love the Lord hate evil. There's a change here. Isn't that a change in mind? You go from, oh, I have no problem with evil, I have no problem with sin, to mortifying the deeds of the flesh, to hating evil. Proverbs 8, 13, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. And these people that fight that pride and arrogancy and the evil way and the froward mouth do I hate. When you say, okay, you're supposed to hate evil, you're supposed to hate sin, and these people that defend sin, what do you see in them? You see pride, you see how arrogant they can get, and the evil way, how they love the evil way, and they have a froward mouth. Pretty interesting. Yeah. Uh, Romans 8, 14 and 15. Let's go back to Romans 8, 14 and 15. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, it's a capital S on Spirit again, they are the sons of God. For he that, for ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. Remember, we're not given a spirit of fear. 
but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Okay? We are now called the sons of God. You have the Holy Spirit in you. Okay, spirit of adoption. But the biggest thing in there is the spawn bondage again to fear. Who is the day in 14? For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Talking about saved sinners. And ye in verse 15, for ye have received the spirit, for ye have not received the spirit of bondage. Again, to fear. Saved sinners. So you go back and said, ye have received um, for as many are as led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So people who are carnally minded, they're not led by the Spirit of God. Therefore, they're not the sons of God. Verse 15, For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. But you have these people that are carnally minded, walking after the flesh, they're in bondage to the flesh, and yet they're trying to claim to be saved. Okay? They haven't received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. 2 Timothy 1.7 Not having a spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind that we talked about. So when you get saved, you're no longer in bondage to uh, the flesh. The flesh does not control you. Brothers and sisters in Christ, praise the Lord, God saved you, opened your eyes big time. Praise the Lord. Those of you who are out there that are professing Christians, you look at your life, and like I said, I had somebody who was newly saved hit me up, I'm like, you're struggling with it though, right? He's like, yeah, it's sin in my life, and I'm struggling with it. There's a difference between struggling with sin and justifying sin, being newly saved and being a mature Christian. Milk versus meat, okay? God just starting to work on you, to God's been working on you for a long time, okay? There's supposed to be a difference. That's the, th the thing. You're struggling with sin, that's great. You're newly saved, I have grace for you, like I'm supposed to have. But you have someone who's just sitting there for years and years and years and years. I've been saved since I was five years old, you know, and he's like 30, 40, 50 years old, and he just a drunk, fornicator, drug addict, uh, playing video games, movies, watching Hollywood movies and TV shows and whatever that the Bible says is a sin. He doesn't read the Bible as much as he, as he should. Oh, I read it last week. I'm good. I'm good for the next three weeks. It's just once a month maybe. It's all, you, know, you know what I'm saying? You get into this and you look at that person it's like, uh, that person isn't saved. Why? Because they're still carnally minded. They're not spiritually minded. What's their attitude towards that sin in their life? They don't have a problem with it. But you're not in bondage to the flesh. So Romans 8.16. Okay. We're almost done. 8.16. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Uh, Romans 9.1. Just over one. I say the truth in Christ, I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. What's going on there? The Spirit itself bearing witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Over here where it says lower as spirit, uh, spiritually minded is life and peace. Your conscience, the word conscience I believe sometimes is also a reference to your spirit, your heart, um, your conscience can bear witness with the Holy Ghost. Right? God's going to show you things. Your conscience is going to bear witness with the Holy Spirit and someone else's Holy Spirit when they teach something you're gonna be like oh, I was just going through that oh, I just read that study and I'm like Lord you just show me something new and then I flip on YouTube and here's another brother in Christ doing a Bible study video on exactly what God just showed me or you're going through something rough in your life and you turn on the, a Bible study and it's directed right at you you're having to deal with lost people and it's just hard and everything, and you just start feeling down, and you flip it up, and all of a sudden you, 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 know, you call up a, fr a brother in Christ, email a brother in Christ, and you get a letter of encouragement that encourages you, and it just seems to fit exactly what you're going through. Okay? When you're truly saved, your spirit's going to bear witness with the Holy Spirit. Lost people can't do that. Okay. Verse 17. If children, oh yeah, real quick, I, I don't want to leave.
leave this out. Romans 8, 16 that we just read about the Holy Spirit bearing witness with uh, your spirit. Uh, 1 John 5, 13. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Who does it take to open this book to you? The Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit can open this up to say, hey, you may know you have eternal life. So the Holy Spirit bears witness with your spirit, and you can say, I'm saved. you got to get to a point where you say, I am saved. Right? The Holy Spirit can get you to doubt your salvation sometimes. Satan can get you to doubt your salvation sometimes. You, oftentimes when you're newly saved, I've had newly saved brethren say, you know what, I just don't know. I mean, my life is kind of sinful and wicked. I'm like, you're newly saved, right? Well, yeah, God's taking his time. He's going to start working on you. It's going to get better. Trust the Lord. Stay in the Word. Obey the Lord's commands. Get that sin out of your life. It will get better as far as your life won't be so full of sin that you're going to doubt your salvation all the time. If you are, and you've been saved for 10 years, and your life is just so wicked and everything, you, know, you might want to check to see if you're carnally minded versus spiritually minded. So, He can bear witness with you through the Holy Word. The Holy Spirit, through God's Word, can testify of things. I know I can, I'm saved. Because this Bible says I'm saved, and I can understand it because I have the Holy Spirit in me, bearing witness. So, for encouragement, we're going to keep going for Romans 8, 17, and 18. Romans 8, 17, and 18. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, even so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. What's going to happen when you have a changed life? This is supposed to be encouraging, brothers and sisters in Christ. You're going to start going through sufferings as a Christian. You're going to get things out of your life. You're going to go from the flesh and the mind being in sync, carnally minded, walking after the flesh. They're in sync. They're best friends. Uh, I'm trying to think the right word. Uh, partners in crime, if you want to say it like that. When you go to get saved, you're going to become spiritually minded, and that war is going to start. Okay? But it's worth it. The sufferings in this life, the way family's going to turn on you because you're going to have that changed life. Family's going to turn on you. Friends, you're going to lose a lot of friends if you have any um, today in these last days. Um, life is going to be hard. You're not going to have your best life now. God will still give you peace and God will still give you joy. But remember, it's nothing. What you're going through now is nothing compared to what we will go through in the future. Okay? The glory which we shall be revealed in us. Okay, We get to go to heaven and spend eternity worshiping the Lord, serving the Lord. You know, that you can't compare any kind of suffering on this earth. It can, can be compared to that whatsoever. Um, Romans 8, 35. We're going to jump down to 35 and 39. Once you're saved, because I believe in eternal security... This whole thing isn't about you being saved and you can lose your salvation and whatnot. Once you're saved, you're saved. Okay? Verse 35, another thing for encouragement, brothers and sisters in Christ. You've seen the change in your life. You've got the Holy Spirit in you. God's cleaning up your life, whether you're newly saved or what you call a veteran, a mature Christian. Okay? You've seen this stuff. But there's times today, especially today, people are coming in and trying to say what you've always believed is wrong. Um, there's times where it can be, but I'm talking about today, things are just out in the open. Things that are being taught today, they wouldn't have dared teach them a hundred years ago. They've been called heretics and liars and deceivers and servants of Satan. You know, you ever seen those things where people are being run off by having tomatoes thrown on them? They would have had tomatoes thrown at them and everything. Today it's mainstream. Okay? You cannot lose your salvation in this, uh, dispensation, what we call the church age, from the death of Jesus Christ, death, burial, and resurrection, to when he comes in the cloud to call his bride home, the catching away of the body of Christ, before the time of Jacob's trouble. So verse 35 through 39. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? Now we read up there in 18. Okay, it's the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. 
As it is written, For thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. If you're still in the flesh, this doesn't apply to you. If you're in Christ Jesus, this applies to you. And thank you, Lord, that it applies to me. Okay. So, that's it with this study. Uh, Romans chapter 9. So we see this right here, given a prelude. I th hope that's the right word, prelude. Before we get into 1 and 2 Corinthians, Paul is setting the standard saying, this is what I went through, this is what a Christian goes through. And then when, we get, when we got through Romans 8, sorry, Romans 8, not 9, that we just did, it shows that, hey, this is, has to happen this way. What Paul went through in 7, it happens this way. Why? Because what's the opposite of what happened to Paul? Carly minded. You can't be carnally minded. It's not just a one-time experience that Paul had and it was just for him and it's not for anybody else. It's for every saved sinner. Okay? You're not to be carnally minded. Can a Christian be carnally minded and be a Christian? No, you can't. Get that out of your vocabulary, carnal Christian. When I ask somebody, can you show me in the Bible where it says carnal Christian? A Christian has a title of being carnal, show me that in the Bible, they can't do it. We need to get that out of our vocabulary. There is no such thing as a carnal Christian. Okay? There's a Christian that's newly saved that has a lot of carnal things in their life, which we'll get into in First and Second Corinthians, but there's no such thing as a carnal Christian. Carnal means that your flesh runs you. You are carnally minded. Newly saved, you're going to have a lot of carnal things left in you from when you were carnal, were carnally minded, and God's going to start cleaning up your life. There's no such thing as a veteran Christian saying, oh, you can still be carnal. We've got to start getting that out of our vocabulary, okay? Uh, you can be a saved sinner, okay? But you need to have a certain attitude towards that sin now. There's a different attitude and change in mind when it comes to that sin. So I will see you in the next study. Uh, grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you and my love for you, which is in Christ Jesus. See you in the next video.